Hi everyone. You can see it's a black background slideshow, which means we are talking about themes in adult education and leadership development. And so today we're going to be talking about Bloom's taxonomy. It's actually one of the very most uh, influential theories behind education practice worldwide. It is extremely influential. It is used highly within competency-based education and training, which is the model that I use in my adult education work. Um, at the end of this video, you'll be able to appreciate the role of Bloom's taxonomy in adult education and skills development. You'll investigate the verbs used in learning outcomes and their role in defining the taxonomy. You'll describe the various domains of learning. You'll discuss the rigor relevance model as a counterpoint and offshoot to Bloom's taxonomy and you define the Bloom's two sigma scenario. And this sounds like a lot of gobbledygook, but those of you who've been following along my classes will see exactly what I mean by each of these different theme points as we go into this discussion today. So Benjamin Bloom was a uh, American um, education theorist and psychologist, and he worked at the University of Chicago in the 19, late 1940s and 1950s, and did a lot of work on understanding education praxis and um, taxonomy. Taxonomy, what on earth do we mean by that? That It means that we're using really deliberate wording and um, building a hierarchy behind these words to help build a progression and a progressive model for learning. You know, I like when um, introducing some of these different thought leaders, I like to give some quotes and this is a great quote. Creativity follows mastery. So mastery of skills is the first priority for young talent. And that really is a theme that I speak about quite a bit in my teaching, the idea of cycles to mastery, that we are working through this progressive cyclical approach to learning so that we become masters of the skill sets that we need. So what is Bloom's taxonomy? Uh, Bloom went through and uh, his main theory was that there is an order to how we learn. And so we start with this foundational aspect of remembering. And then we start to be able to understand. We take those facts that we remember and we can start to add complexity to them. From there, we're able to apply that knowledge that we've got from remember and understanding. So we can start using it in useful ways. And those of you who have been following along in our courses notice that quite often we are jumping straight to the application phase as fast as possible when we're doing all these different videos, because I want you to be able to use the stuff that you're learning and that application is really foundational in adult education. You are learning because you are going to be using it in a job. So quite oftentimes in adult education, we jump straight to that application phase as fast as possible. From there, we start to add even more complexity. So we're analyzing, we're, we're looking at all sorts of different counterpoint um, to different pieces of knowledge that we've collected and being able to identify strategy behind that, we can do evaluation. And from there, the, the what's considered the most complex is where we start to use it as a creative skill set. And so we're able to take all of these foundational skills and create new things and new ideas and solve problems using that knowledge. So those of you who are taking the course at Niagara College in uh, food innovation know that we are very focused on this creative mindset and the faster that we can take the skills that we have uh, in terms of foundational knowledge and foundational application and start to use it as a creative endeavor whether that is creating new food products creating new food safety systems creating new processes honestly the faster we can get to creation the more successful you are going to be in terms of your career progression, especially related to food science. Now, you have likely noticed at the beginning of each of my videos, I use a 
at the beginning of this video, you are going to be able to do, and that is very much a Bloom's taxonomy praxis. Now you'll notice that each of the different verbs has different types of verbs or action words that are associated with it. So in the lower taxonomy, you're looking at things like telling or selecting or searching, very basic looking up stuff. Later on, you're starting to do things like summarizing and explaining and generalizing or describing things. And that's we're, we're progressing higher in terms of being able to use that skill set. Then we're jumping into that application phase. So we're starting to uh, prepare, present, um, implement, execute, and so on. Then we're starting to jump to even more complexity. So analyzing, calculating, deconstructing, estimating, explaining. We're adding more complexity all the way up to things like uh, measuring, justifying, judging, hypothesizing. Hey, those of you who are in second year know that I'm challenging you as fast as possible to start to make good hypotheses. Experimenting. Oh, all of these are great verbs that are much more higher order thinking processes. And last but not least, we're at that really creative aspect. So leading, making, managing, mixing, modifying, negotiating, planning. These are all much more complex simulations. For example, we often are doing research and development simulations in class, and that is a very strategic that we want you to have the chance to try out the types of roles and responsibilities that you would have in the workplace as fast as possible while you are in a supported environment and can get feedback and can get motivation from instructors to help you be the best that you possibly can be. Now, when we're thinking about thinking theory, Bloom also spoke quite a bit about the fact that we have a wide, a number of different learning domains, a wide variety is what I was going to say, we have three of them. So we have the cognitive domain and that's where you're thinking about thinking. And that is that learning praxis that that aspect of you see it, you assimilate it in your brain, and you then own that knowledge. That's the cognitive domain. There are also aspects to the effective domain, and that's where you're looking at emotions and values. So, for example, in food science, we often talk about food safety culture and the importance of having a sense of ethics and principles that you shouldn't be going out and adulterating food or doing food fraud or... Um, engaging in nefarious practices, undercutting the quality of food products. That's one good example of effective domain learning, having a, an appreciation for the culture and the um, sociodynamics of food is also aspect of effective domain. We want to make sure that you learn and appreciate the emotional component of what you are doing. Last but not least is the psychomotor domain, and that's where you're physically doing something. So those of you who are, for example, in norms class, you'll often come and yell at people saying, you don't have any knife skills. In many cases, the psychomotor domain is incredibly important for success in the field. And if you were a chef, a classical chef, your psychomotor skill set, your ability to physically do something is absolutely tantamount to your skill. Food science is less reliant on the psychomotor domain, but think about many of the skill sets that you do in the laboratory. So if you are pipetting in Sunan's class or using a microscope or doing a titration, those are psychomotor skill sets. And when you're doing all of those laboratory practices, you are enabling your psychomotor domain as part of that learning process. So Bloom's taxonomy is applicable across these different domains, and the, the verbs that you would use would be slightly different. Now, there is a bit of uh, additional analysis. As I mentioned, Bloom's taxonomy came out in the 1950s, and it was expanded further in the 1960s. More recently, the International Center for Learning um, Excellence, ICLE, has uh, put out a second model that we quite often use when we talk about Bloom's taxonomy. Um, oftentimes I'm in different debates with different teachers or different uh, training providers who 
specialize in adult education and we we talk about the fact that Bloom's taxonomy is a really important framework, but oftentimes they say, well, you know what, the skill sets for entry level workers are low taxonomy skills. And so just focus on the knowledge piece. And I'm like, no, you know what, in many cases, entry level jobs have mastery skill sets. So for example, if you are a general laborer, you really should have a good mastery skill set of personal hygiene. You should know and be able to practice with a mastery level understanding what is required of you in terms of your personal hygiene, washing your hands, uh, not wearing jewelry. That is something that you have to have mastered. You can't just know it. You have to be able to apply it and you have to be able to understand and justify why you are why you are doing this on a daily basis. It's not it's not difficult. Just the same as things like uh, for small children, tying their shoes eventually should be a mastery skill set. It shouldn't just be something that they can know and describe, but it should be something that they can do. It's not complicated. And that's what we call the rigor of relevance framework. The idea that you do need to be able to use that skill set at a mastery level. And so very high level taxonomy within Bloom's taxonomy but then you also have to be able to apply it to relevant situations within and across your discipline. And so in many cases, the taxonomy that we're using could be quite low. For example, do I care that you can apply Bloom's taxonomy? Not necessarily, but I hope that you're able to push it into real world type situations as fast as possible. And so in many cases, like this is not a uh, course in education, but honestly, food scientists are often in training and leadership roles as supervisors and so on. And the, you need to think about your function as a supervisor, training other people in a skill set. How quickly can you take that skill set from just acquiring that skill set to being able to apply it and troubleshoot it in the real world? I, I speak quite a bit with different graduates of the program, and oftentimes they say, well, how do I help people be able to make decisions? The teams that I'm leading, the people that I'm supervising, how do I help them make decisions? And I'm like, when you're teaching them, are you helping them push it into real world applications as fast as possible so that they can start to make those judgment calls? For example, if they have to monitor a CCP on a line or they have to make judgment calls about sanitation protocols, they need to be able to quickly think about the unpredictability and not always go and rely on the supervisor to make those decisions. They should be they should be double checking with the supervisor, but they should be able to quickly assimilate and make decisions that are relevant to the application. So this does make sense for you to learn because as a food scientist, odds are very good that as you progress in your career, you are going to be leading teams and you will be training those teams. Now, something else about Bloom's taxonomy is this two sigma uh, scenario that he uh, posited. He did a lot of research and identified that when students are being trained in that conventional classroom, that didactic model where you have a teacher at the front and they're just talking and the students are there taking notes and assimilating, yeah, they will succeed. They totally will succeed. But the if there is instead this aspect of cycles to mastery and allowing people to challenge themselves in um, real world application scenarios, the more success they're going to have in terms of mastering that skill set. One other thing that he noted was that when that cycles to mastery has an element of one on one mentorship, that the level of success is even higher. And those of you who know my, um, I have, I have a great love for some of the writing of Verna Kirkness, who is a um, First Nations um, education specialist. And she talks a lot about the reciprocal role within the teaching environment, the idea that students are responsible for their learning, teachers are responsible for their learning. And when students and teachers are working in a really collaborative space in one-on-one -on -one or small group settings, responsive to the learning requirements of the student, they're going to succeed even more. That said, the student has to be part of the picture and being active in that learning cycle. So out there asking good questions, out there um, 
seeking feedback from the teacher and so on. People who are engaging in this one-on-one -on -one mentorship, according to Bloom's Two Sigma principle, they are going to be succeeding at two times the standard deviation as people who are learning in a conventional learning environment. So for those of you who are in the Niagara College program, I always say to you, do make sure you're reaching out and asking questions because especially now that we're in the online learning setting, that feedback cycle that we classically would have done in many of the classroom applications labs, we're missing that right now. So much of what we historically would have done in the classroom was that one-on-one -on -one mentorship where we're having really rich conversations to help push people towards those cycles of mastery. So do reach out using um, email. I'm serious about this. When I say reach out, ask me questions, I'm absolutely dead serious. Do reach out, send me emails, leave me comments in the YouTube channel. And if you're registered in the course, you know how to find me. <laughs> so again, back to back to uh, our Bloom's taxonomy. I always, uh, it, he, he spoke of it as a bit of a ladder or a staircase climbing up towards that, that um, higher level order thinking. And I often think about my students doing this. I, I miss drawing on the chalkboard in the classroom. And so I, ha I had to get myself a wake on board so I could draw on the PowerPoints for you. And so in essence, you, are, you as a student need to work as fast as possible to get to those creative skill sets so that you can have a level of mastery over the domain that you're studying and encourage you to find your mentor who's going to cheer you on. And whether that's me or whether that's some other instructor or perhaps a mentor in the industry that you have found, you want to find that cheerleader who is going to help you and encourage you to keep on learning because that will help you succeed faster in this environment. So that's my talk about Bloom's Taxonomy today. Do remember the rigor relevance framework and do jump into those real world unpredictable situations as fast as possible within your learning scenario so that you can go through that troubleshooting. And last but not least, one more quote from our good friend, Dr. Bloom. What any person in the world can learn, almost all persons can learn if provided with appropriate prior and current conditions of learning. So do take the time, take the time to learn, take the time to ask questions and challenge yourself as part of your learning cycle. You know, I've already said it a hundred times in this discussion, but reach out to me anytime if you have questions and I look forward to hearing from you. Take good care.